What up, what up, Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. On this show, we talk about crowdfunding and specifically get into real world entrepreneurs every single week that are raising capital from the crowd. And today is no exception where we talk with an individual who has successfully raised money using equity crowdfunding in the past and is now coming to you and sharing with you and revealing everything that goes into his uh, views of a raise and some of the advice that he has for you. So to me, you know, this is one of the most cool ways in which you can learn and understand and become a student of crowd crowdfunding. You really have to educate yourself when it comes to entering a new discipline, whether that's raising capital, whether that's starting a new business, or even getting your just ideas out there in new and innovative ways, building a crowd or a tribe around your work. These are all things that are completely possible today, but the number one thing you have to be willing to do is to educate yourself. Now, to be honest, you know, I got started in the crowdfunding industry in 2012, and um, I'll be quite frank with you, you know, school, education, college was not my cup of tea. I didn't really enjoy learning about outdated archaic subjects, you know, like geometry or things that I just never was gonna apply to my real life for what I was interested in. And I felt that very strongly in college, and maybe you also felt that I went to school at George Washington University. I ended up you know, graduating with an econ degree. I did a mini econ thesis, comparing the different categories on Kickstarter, doing a logistic regression, and comparing the variables that affect success. And that sounds all great, sounds all cool. But at the end of the day, my biggest jumps, my biggest improvements in my life have come when I've learned something new. When I've actually dedicated myself to becoming a student of a craft, whether that's blogging in 2012, whether that's starting a podcast in 2015, doing my YouTube channel, whatever it is, or in general, learning exactly every single week what's happening in terms of the crowdfunding industry and being on the cutting edge, these are the ways that I found to be able to have leaps forward in my own life and also that of my students. Whenever I've had a student who has really prioritized being willing to understand what goes into a raise, the mechanics of crowdfunding, understanding as well the resources and tools that are available to you, what other players are doing in the industry, what a campaign even looks like, the more you prioritize this in your life, the faster you're going to make leaps forward in progress. And what you really do is you increase your potential. And this is one of the coolest things that anyone can do, but for specifically, I think for someone who's not going to live or not going to go through a traditional path necessarily, I think that crowdfunding is like no other when it comes to a tool which can allow you to connect with the crowd, can allow you to raise funding and get something new out there to actually impact the world for the positive. So if you are interested in staying up to date with the cutting edge tools, techniques, resources, strategies, everything that goes into a successful crowdfunding campaign, and you don't want to have to pay anything, you just want it for free, I got an incredible free newsletter, which I send out every single week called Killer crowdfunding tips where I'm sharing with you the goodies, the golden nuggets that I discover that I'm always discovering and really on the lookout for when it comes to what's working right now to drive massive funding to a new campaign or to get your idea off the ground in completely new ways that no one else has ever heard of. And when you hop on that newsletter, I'll give you the link to do that in just a second. My friend, sometimes people say I am crazy. Sometimes people say, Sal, there's no way that this campaign raised this much. There's no way this entrepreneur is just successful with this idea or this product or this story, right? But I am sharing with you the results. I am sharing with you exactly what they are doing every step of the way and the success stories which you can emulate and you can follow in the footsteps of. So again, go to this link uh, at crowdcrux.com slash newsletter. That link will take you to my killer crowdfunding tips newsletter it is completely free. Enter your name and email and you can join my crowd uh, when it comes to getting the access to this information every single week. Get the access to the right information. Again, crowdcrux.com slash newsletter, crowdcrux, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash newsletter. And for those of you that are interested in really jumping on this uh, game plan when it comes to equity crowdfunding, I also have a great book out there called Equity Crowdfunding Explained, which you can check out at crowdcrux.com slash equity audio. That link is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash equity audio. I've actually got a ton of different books, which I can tell you about at another point in time, but I would love to right now get into today's interview and really discover the tricks that go into actually raising capital from another person's perspective. And you're going to hear from him in just a second. 
Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Today we are speaking with a creator who's been able to create something really cool when it comes to hotel ownership main easy. So this is VIP perks, profit shares, exciting projects, and this campaign is launching on WeFunder. And in addition, today's guest has actually raised money before, and this is their fourth raise. So we're going to be learning a ton um, from today's guest and also kind of getting more of the story here. Nathan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Salvador. Um Glad to be here and excited to kind of, you know, part some of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, as you mentioned, this is kind of our fourth raise for Hotelier Co. Um, but we've been fortunate enough that it's not just the raise for Hotelier Co. We've also done some raises for um, direct properties and hotels kind of outside of the Hotelier Co. umbrella. So, so cool. Awesome, man. Um well, you know, maybe we can get started. Um, I'd love to talk about your current project. Maybe we can first get started. You can just tell the listeners a bit about some of the other ways in which you've raised money and we can kind of start there. Of course. So um, just to kind of give you a little bit about my background. So um, I have been involved in hospitality for close to 20 years now, um, always on the ownership side. So along that journey, um, getting involved with kind of larger brands, some institutional money, uh, it's a very exciting market. And over the last kind of three to five years, especially post-COVID, there's been a huge swing into lifestyle and luxury boutique hospitality. Mm -hmm. And with the advent of crowdfunding, um, with my background, I've seen some huge opportunities to, to kind of get into that space and allow people to kind of bridge across and have the option to diversify into hotels. And at the moment with RAs kind of diversify into um, hotel and brand management companies, if you will. Mm -hmm. So to give you a little background on Hotelier Co, uh, we started our first, we actually started our first raise uh, in a different form. It was a larger project in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, it was one that we actually had started raising money for, but it, it ran into COVID. So that one had to be put on ice. Um, but COVID did bring about some interesting changes. So we have we did sit on the sidelines for a while before we did our first official raise for Hotelier Co. Um, but the shift to lifestyle and kind of the smaller experiential hotels actually lended itself to us kind of taking a small pivot and predominantly focusing on that style of product. Mm -hmm. So when we did our first raise going back, I think it was in 2021, we started our first raise when we kicked off, call it the, the version of Hotelier Co that we have now. Uh, we, we ended up finding two development projects. Uh, one, one's in Virginia and one in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And those projects were kind of lending itself to the lifestyle spin that you know we see as the biggest gap in the market was this a was this a reg d was this a reg crowdfunding what, what kind of raise did you do so we did the first we actually did an attempted um regulation a plus was actually our first raise um that's the one that we ran into COVID. um the, the project was ready to go with the debt players um in place and unfortunately debt for hospitality disappeared uh in early 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, so following that, the the raises that we've done through Hotelier Co have actually all been Regulation CF uh, raises. The one that we're doing now, we're actually doing a bolt-on Regulation D raise coinciding with the crowdfunding raise on WeFunder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that we avoided that uh, in the first raise is because the limit used to be a million dollars. And, you know, when when you're looking at hospitality assets, there's not really much you can do with a million. Um, but when they changed the limit to 5 million, it kind of opened a lot more avenues, mm -hmm. um, especially where, when you can combine that 5 million with a Regulation D funding round, it kind of opens yeah. it up to much, much larger scale. So okay. with that change, we kind of pivoted to Regulation CF because um, from a timing perspective, it's much, much more expeditious. I know our, our first Reg A plus offering, I think it took us around 14 months to get the first one qualified. And as yeah. you can imagine, real estate, time can kill deals. So if you need 14 and months- it costs so much. It's like, a, it's an arm yeah. and leg to do a Reg A plus. How much did you yeah. raise with the with the Reg CF one? 
So the first one, <clears throat> I think we we raised about a hundred and I think it was 160, 150, 160,000. In total, I can't remember the exact number for the first raise, but across the first three raises, we raised around 350,000 direct to Hotelier Co. And the way that we set them up, so for instance, the property in Virginia, mm -hmm. that one we actually own, it's this beautiful historic commercial building in a car park, and we are converting it to a boutique train themed hotel so we're taking it's it's actually in a town called clifton forge which has a phenomenal history uh rich in rail and the gentleman john howard who actually bought the project to us and is actually staying involved and um going to be running it was a train engineer uh, for the last kind of 45 to 50 years of his work career mm -hmm. um so he has got a huge knowledge in it and that project, we did fund part of it through Hotelier Co, um, through our CF raise. So we, we own a quarter of that. And we did kind of use friends and family, if you will, to kind of cool. fill out that raise. So it's kind of oh. the same philosophy we're using. Um, we're, we're intending to close on an operating asset next week, and it's a very similar approach. So Got it. Uh, we're using friends and family for the majority of the raise, and we're supplementing with um, crowdfunding. Are, are you doing these? Did you do that other campaign on WeFunder or did you do it on a different platform? So we actually did it. We've done the first three and the current one all through WeFunder. Um, look, there, there's a few options out there. We we did, you know, go through a couple of the other channels. Um, and so far, we've quite enjoyed working with WeFunder. Um, they're, they're flexible and they, they're prepared to work with you. So uh, we've had a good okay. experience with them. Um, awesome, man. Started. Where we're tracking at the moment. Very cool, very cool. So you've had some success when it comes to raising money successfully with WeFunder. Um, you've been expanding. You've been doing more when it comes to this. So, you know, for those people that are not familiar, um, what would you say is like the big unique quality when it comes to this company? Um, you mentioned this this new like growing trend, right, of luxury boutique hospitality lifestyle. Um, what, what would you say is the biggest unique selling point when it comes to your brand that you're growing? Sure. So, uh, you know, apart from the opportunity that uh, it brings, um, there's, there's not many chances where you get to invest and be part of kind of the fund and management side of a hospitality business. So we offer that as well as kind of holding the real estate assets. But where the, where the big advantage comes in, so my, my background running large funds and I've actually worked on, um, I've worked with intercontinental hotel groups um, internationally kind of buying and selling assets. And one of the largest expenses in the industry is the cost you pay to the brand companies. So, you know, with a typical asset and if you put a brand on it, uh, you pay basically for their guidance of you know, how to make the hotel fit to the brand that you're using. So it does take a lot of effort from someone that doesn't know a lot about hospitality. It's like they can hold your hand in the setup process mm -hmm. and what you need to do to make the product look good. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, they help push um, members of their platform to your hotel. And for doing that, you pay, you know, relatively substantial fees and what what I see as the opportunity is well as as an owner, if I'm paying for you know the brand to be attached to my hotel, and although there's benefit for that, there is a huge cost that the brand companies pay kind of fighting the online travel agents to get their fair share and try to push it through their brands. Mm -hmm. But they're not, you know, it's very rare that it's hotel specific. So you're hoping to capture. Um, some of that marketing, but yet you're paying the full freight of it. Understood. Understood. Um, so, so when yeah. it comes to, you know, when it comes to crowdfunding, I mean, it sounds like you have been using this as a way to supplement your friends and family around, right? And you've been able to be successful with it so far. Do you feel like there are any advice or tips that you could um, impart to the audience, you know, when it comes to what you found to work well to get people to take action or to get them on the page, um, you know, checking out your your offering. So there's there's a few angles to that question. So let me say the the biggest I'd say difficulty, um, especially when it comes to hospitality or real estate, 
is timing. So anything that you do in the crowdfunding space is going to take more time than I guess you can anticipate as well as cost. So if you think about it from, and, and this might be a bad analogy, but you know, as, as you're starting any type of business, it's almost like learning to juggle with 50 or 60 balls and figuring out which ones to catch while they're in the air. <laughs> and then when you add regulation crowdfunding to it, you know, you're adding in additional layers of legal complexity, you're adding in the digital marketing and media spend. You have to find a portal or a broker dealer that you're going to work with. And so it's like trying to juggle alongside of them and figuring it out all at the same time. And obviously they're doing multiple projects. So even though, you know, obviously when you're running your own company, it's everything to you and it's the most important. Um, but it's about kind of the patience of dealing with other groups and trying to corral everything together mm. all at once. And with real estate, you know, you lose one or two months on you know a few of the service providers that can actually kind of pull a deal under. So I'd say the biggest um, advice that I would give anyone looking to utilize crowdfunding is make sure you've got a long a long runway in terms of time for what you and when you need that money, um, especially in the first couple. It takes you know you know I, I like to think that I might be aggressive in my approach to timing. Um, so what you think might be possible in a two or three months before you know it, it's taken six or seven months to kind of mm. get ready and up and launched. So, so be well prepared. Kind of yeah. 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 Be well prepared. Be aware of the timeline. Know the road ahead, right, when it comes to that. Um, you, know, you mentioned digital marketing. Do you feel like there are any lessons you learned when it comes to digital marketing and sort of combining with this with this new way of, of raising funding? How do you get people to show up, I guess, is, the, is a better question. Yeah, that's... <laughs> And if you've got other other people on the show that have great advice, I'm prepared to listen to that as well. Um, look, that's that's probably the most difficult part. Um, I know that when the first few rounds, we actually did go through um, some digital agencies. Uh, what I found is finding the right digital marketing team who not only own your like not only understand your business, but also equity crowdfunding is very difficult to find. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had a lot of difficulty on that in the first few rounds, the, the, the social media and marketing side, we probably didn't get the same return on investment that I would have hoped. Um, but it's all about finding the right crowd. So as an example, the property that we're um, hopefully closing on soon, um, the gentleman that that's selling that to us and is going to stay involved in the project has a very strong handle um, on mm. digital marketing. And so he alone in the first um year that they kind of got this project up and running, managed to generate about 150, 160,000 uh, followers across social media. And they were, they were the right people. Mm. So one of the approaches that we're starting to take <clears throat> is looking at not only do you have to kind of advertise and kind of get the right digital marketing play for the, you know, Hotelier co-brand or the management company that owns part of these, um, what we see as being successful is also focusing heavily on the individual projects. So for instance, the project I just mentioned has about 160,000, I think it's 165,000 followers. Mm -hmm. The rail project, um, our target over the first year will be get 150,000 followers or so. And as we do each project by project where we have a cool lifestyle project with its own story and its own unique characteristics that will pull in a crowd that's interested in that direct project. And then we actually then put an Hotelier Co umbrella over everything. And then we start to look for a way to cross pollinate um, across those properties. So, you know, the people the that story. might be interested in the yeah. Yeah, they might be interested in the railroad, let's bring them across to Hotelier Co, let them know about other, you know, the projects are all in that lifestyle boutique, cool, storied. Mm hospitality arena so it's let's develop them individually at each pro property and then let's cross pollinate them all and let people understand what else is available kind of in the industry and everything works together because all of those investments not only can you be part of each one of them individually that's you know once we get to that stage and the overarching company and as they do cross pollinate, each one of them becomes more successful in their own right. So that's that's kind of the model. Of talking. That's very wise, yeah. And I think that's a great way to kind of leverage community and also tell your story in a unique way. 
So, you know, it sounds like you're saying, number one, find a, a good digital marketing partner if you can, but number two, yeah. also be willing to tell your story and doing it broadly, right? And bring communities together. If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight, and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is f u l f i l l r i t e dot com slash checklist. Fulfillright dot com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. Looking at your campaign, dude, you got a ton of people that are singing your praises. Like looking here, what people say. You know, people saying that they're investing um, because they believe in your proposal. Other people saying they're just trying to find a good investment. They came across yours. They want to get into the hotel industry. Some other people love traveling via train, hotels, equity they're in. So you have a lot of people that you're giving this opportunity to actually participate in the hospitality industry. Yes. Yeah. Which is exciting, you know, especially because I guess that's what I'm passionate about and that's my background. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if, if this opportunity was available, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, I would have jumped on it, <laughs> but it wasn't possible then. Um, so yeah, I'm just excited to be able to bring this to people. Um, and do kind of what I've always been doing, but just allowing it to be accessible by, I guess, mm -hmm. the people that also are going to use the products. So, I, th um, I think it yeah. takes. Um, I think it takes a lot of guts, a lot of gumption to really move forward on something like this, especially when there's a lot of uncertainty, like around COVID and that time. Um, have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur? Do you do you label yourself that way? How would you identify yourself? Well, I I don't know that I ever label myself. Um, but yes, I've I've been involved in a couple of smaller businesses um, on the side. So I'd say I'm entrepreneurial at heart. I always look for the bigger picture, um, something exciting, something new that isn't available in the market. Um, but I'd say the the benefit is I have actually worked a lot more of the um, I call it institutional work, but I don't know that it's your typical institution. Uh, Australia is run quite different than the US, so. Um, getting involved and working on funds, um, although not, you know, necessarily entrepreneurial in the American sense. Um, you know, I used to run a circa $1 billion fund in Australia with about three or four other people. Um, so getting yes. access. That's a great leverage the, right there. Yeah. Wow. yeah so, so getting access to these large deals. And I guess, you know, the, the amount of deals and the complex deals that I've actually been fortunate enough to be involved in. Um, adding that to then also trying to start your own business, I think is very beneficial. I don't know that I could have done this without it. Mm -hmm. um, and it also helps with a lot of the relationships that um, it allows me to pull on, you know, when you need the larger pieces of capital. So, so, so yeah. I mean, just to kind of condense that, I would say, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like you were on one side of the equation, which is more of like the finance side of providing and allocating capital, right? And now you've yes. kind of shifted to the other side. Yes. So I did, did start on the fund management side. Um, and then I did spend some time um, on an international capacity with one of the brand companies, Intercontinental, mm -hmm. which is very, you know, g given that the way the hospitality business plays together, there's there's three key components. So you've got the ownership side, which is effectively what Hotelier Co is. Um, you have the hotel management side. So I was actually um, chief strategy officer for a global management company called Valor, who are you know exceptional exceptional managers. So mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to be with them for a few years, um, helping them grow. And then you know having the, the ownership side as my key strength has mm -hmm. kind of given me access to kind of all three parts of the equation. Which I love that. Um, very, I've been very fortunate. A lot of people don't have access to that. And then taking taking that to starting my own company that kind of leans on all three of, you know, all three parts of that equation. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, if they're working at a billion dollar fund with like three or four other people, right? They got a nice cushy job and like they don't have to worry about much. The idea of like jumping ship and doing your own thing, like that just seems to me like something that not a lot of people want to do. Like what, what really motivated you to, you know, do your own thing and to, to want to get this out there? Yeah. So look, 
the main the main reason we I first kind of made the shift and moved to the US was I enjoyed working in hospitality in Australia, but it's a much smaller market, and I love trying to structure things and do you know structure things in a more unique way that you know allows you know everyone to make more money. And the industry in Australia is a lot more regimented. Um, a lot of the funds in Australia actually come from large superannuation funds, which is the equivalent of the 401k here. Mm-hmm. And so th- there's a lot less flexibility. So the one thing I love about the US is everything becomes almost a possibility um, as long as all sides understand what you're trying to pull together. Yeah. So the the first dive over to the US was um, wanting to get exposure and have access to kind of a larger field of opportunity. Mm, got it, got it. And then coming from that side of more of like the institutional side and understanding the inner workings of, of really the capital engine, right? Um, do you feel like there are any lessons that you learned from your years doing that that have served you as a founder and entrepreneur that the listeners might benefit from? Um, well, it's, it's complicated, but there's so some of the things that you can do, and I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I'll, I'll kind of give an example and hopefully that is leading you in the right direction. Um, so one of the examples that you get to see when you look at more of a portfolio level than individual assets. Um, so as an example, when you have a large portfolio and an agreement with a brand company, um, one of the requirements is how much you have to spend on furniture, fixtures and equipment to make sure that the hotel is kept up to the right standard for the brand. And so you might have a, a contract that requires you to spend 5%. Now, one of the things that I like about being able to play with the different kind of, I guess, goals that the different brand companies versus an owner would have. So for a brand company, it's all about tenure. Um, And for an owner, it's all about the capital value. So for instance, when you have a portfolio, one of the things we did in Australia is, well, let's, let's agree to give the brand an extra 10 years on their agreement in return for lowering our required FF&E spend. So on a billion dollar fund, you know, that small change can add 50 or $100 million to the value of the portfolio. So there's there's things like that that you can start to play with as your portfolio grows. So for as, as an example, like let's say we, we've got our, hopefully our third asset next week. Um, we have some, hopefully some pool of money behind us that we can go to a few more of these later this year. And what happens is if you think in hospitality, you start to grow that portfolio and now you have synergies across the brands where you can kind of play them off each other. Mm. But the other thing you can start to look at is with crowdfunding, like if you think about, um, so let's say we had seven properties in Texas that were all remotely close to each other and each one of them, for instance, requires uh, heavy landscaping in them. And once you have seven assets, well, now you actually have enough scale and certainty that you could create your own landscaping company. And now you've got a multiple on that. So if you think about it at a portfolio level, and if they're close enough with crowdfunding, every expense line for a hotel could potentially become its own business that you also control and run. That's that's very creative. Yeah, I love that. So so things like that, that you probably wouldn't, you know, as, as an entrepreneur coming in from the ground up, I guess it's, you know, people can come up with that type of idea, but having more exposure to that on a larger portfolio um, lends itself to, you know, additional avenues to to give growth to all of our investors. So it's almost as well for, you know, for someone who's listening, thinking also about what is the expense item that you're under for someone else's larger company, right? And really thinking backwards of, okay, if I'm going after this larger company, right, in some kind of way for my revenue for a product or a service, being aware of the environment they're playing in and how much they're allocating yes. to those budgets. Yep, hundred percent, Salvador. That's it. So it's it's understanding the key drivers of the other party, um, because not you know one of the things, especially when you can look at a brand company. So the brand company is all about rooms that they have and how they're competing with other brands. So their motivations aren't always necessarily financial. So it's just understanding what what's of value to the other party that's not necessarily financial that can put you in a um, you know a better financial position 
than if you didn't have that negotiation tool. Very cool. Well, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I think that's a that's a really great insight, right? When it comes to just thinking um, creatively and thinking outside of the box. Uh, so I have one or two more questions here for you. Um, you know, so the first one would be in really thinking about this, and you mentioned the story, right? For you as an entrepreneur, as a creator, um, w- what is the end goal here? Is it to build out a massive portfolio and sell this? Is it to do IPO? Like, what's the end goal when it comes to to your brand? Yeah, so the way um, I see this playing out is I'll, I'll use an example of another company that has in a similar space in the kind of the single family is if you look at here.co, H-E-R-E.co, they're basically a platform that allows people to trade kind of Airbnb single rentals. So where we plan on getting is having our own kind of almost we're not being a portal because we don't want to go through the fin yeah the regulations and the requirements to do so but basically allowing people to come on see which hotels that we manage and having the option of oh I'd, I'd love to own part of this hotel like what's the story behind it okay so it's the history of rail it's really cool I want to own part of that so allowing people to access ownership of individual hotels as well as the overall management company. So Hotelier Co. will own a small part of each of the hotels. We're going to get the management fee from them and then promotes for our performance. Plus we own the brands and kind of the people that come through, but that whole audience kind of comes under the Hotelier Co. umbrella. So we want to be at a point in the future where we have a portfolio of really cool, storied, unique lifestyle hospitality. Um, We might even have a few of them that almost become a sub-brand that we build out. And people can just come on and you know they become part of our community they have access to any of the hotels they want and then once they visit a hotel you know there'll be appropriate discounts for being an owner um you know i'd like to say that the you know being an owner you get treated you know in a a better fashion you get more but we actually want to set these up so everyone gets treated the same um Mm -hmm. everyone gets treated like an owner um but just just opening that up so that you know there's just access to anything it's basically a hospitality collective, if you will. Um, you know, which part very do you cool. want to diversify into and giving people those options? Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, I do have one or two more questions, but where can people go to learn more about your activity here? Where can they go to learn more about your company and your race? Sure. So, I mean, the the best spot, I guess, to find details, especially on this particular raise, uh, is on the WeFunder site. So, if you go to www.wefunder.com slash hotelierco. H O T E L I E R C O. Um, that's that's where all of the information relating to the raise is. Um, the raise is available at the moment for um, kind of in friends and family mode. Uh, we intend to go out to the public starting on the first of September, and you can find a little bit more about our website. We kind of just have a landing page at the moment, um, but if you go to hotelierco.com. Um, you can find out a little bit more about, you know, what we're trying to achieve, um, you know, in terms of creating this collective of hospitality people. Uh, so my, my other question is, you know, in looking back, if you could go back in time and you could give yourself some advice on how to actually achieve what you have, which is, you know, raising capital from friends and family, um, beginning to do a Reg D, doing a successful Reg F. Is there any other advice you would give aside from the story, you know, telling the story and aside from um, digital marketing? Um, do you feel like people should create a Rolodex? Like, do you have any other advice that you feel like would be useful um, for others? So in terms of the crowdfunding itself, I don't know that I I don't know that I could do anything different. Um, I think one of the things about being an entrepreneur is everything that you do leads you to like, you know, everything I've done has led me to where I am today. And I actually think we have a better business model if I think we have a better business model today than if the first project had been successful, right? So um some just it's just as long as you take those learnings and don't be discouraged, but make it your strength, right? Lean on what you've learned and focus on that. So I think we're actually in a much better position. I'd say the biggest key or the the fortunate part that I've had is like you mentioned, it's a Rolodex. So over the last 20 years, um, I have built relationships that are now kind of coming into fruition. So one of the things I've found is in this space, especially once you're starting a new business, um, although people may be excited, um, some of the bigger money 
you know, you have to know these people, they have to get comfortable, and that could take, you know, three, five, ten years um, before they're prepared to write the bigger checks to you. So I think a lot of it just comes down to patience, um, mm-hmm. building those relationships and not getting discouraged if some of them don't necessarily pay off in the first two, three years. What do you consider a bigger check out of curiosity? Uh, you know, two, three, four million dollars. Okay. So if you're trying to go for the big boys, right? You need to make sure you're seen. You need to make sure that you have contact. You need to make sure that they understand what you're doing and sort of see your your success over time and build a relationship over time. Is what you're saying? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Yep. And then you're I kind of cashing in on that that brand equity when they decide to actually invest in you. Correct. Yeah. And I, I think that's the biggest key because um, obviously you need a couple of those big investments um, to really kick off. Uh, trying to do it, you know, with fifty or a hundred thousand here or there. It isn't easy and it's hard to get to any form of scale without you know some of those bigger investments got it well said uh my final question for you here and we can end on this note you can either end with a quote that you like that you've heard before you could end with some advice that someone has given you along the way uh we could end with a final tip um about business or about um you know for other founders in the in the community or even a book recommendation anything like that and we can end on that note Cool. Um, okay. Thanks, Salvador. I, I think look, the biggest probably takeaway that I would have is learning. Other, it may not fit the mold that you just said, but I think it's all about learning to be patient. So one of the biggest things that I've learned is I, especially before kids, my patience was somewhere at the scale of zero. Um, <laughs> And then the kids helped me develop that a little bit. But yeah, being involved in starting your own business, if you don't have patience, you're just not going to get there because, you know, inside, you know what you're capable of Mm -hmm. and, you know, but being able to deliver on it with the right people in the right fashion, you just have to have a lot of patience. So yeah, without that, I think um, you could be in a lot of trouble. Um, but it's something you can definitely develop because if you talk to me 10 years ago, um, I, my patience level levels were very different. So that's kind of, that would be the main thing that I would say for anyone a funding realm. That, that, that's kind of the biggest thing f- that I had to work on, I'd say. Well said, well said. Thank you so much, Nathan, for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Good luck with your future raises here. And, uh, you know, can't wait to see you see you coming out with more stuff. Thanks, Salvador. Appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure chatting. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Brigman. And man, oh man, do I commend you so much for showing up uh, for your own education, for your own training, and really investing into that process, being willing to educate yourself, being willing to just learn new things, download more information into your head, get access to the right information. It takes a little bit of work. And the fact that you're willing to do that, you're willing to show up every single week and really hear from these success stories, man, oh man, I think that's difficult. And I think that you're really showing up. That's exactly the habits that go in into a successful crowdfunding campaign. Now, sometimes we talk a lot as course about success on this show, but sometimes you're going through a period of your life. You're even going, you've recently gone through a period of your life where it's made you question everything. One time I actually went through a very similar period to this. This is actually early in my career and had a not so great experience one night where I, I haven't really shared this story publicly very much, but I was out with my friends, was drinking a bit too much, had too much fun, and lo and behold, I actually ended up in the hospital and it was a really unfortunate really bad situation and for me it was one of those lowest moments uh, that really made me reevaluate a lot in my career and a lot of what I was doing with my life is life just about enjoyment and partying and even to the extent of doing it so much that you end up in an environment that you don't want to be in and what I realized at that point in time when I was literally in the hospital and then eventually later on thinking through that experience what I realized was that I was making choices that were not moving my life forward in the way that I wanted to. And it was such a difficult realization and I really had to swallow it. I really had to swallow my ego. But once I did, man oh man, it felt like I had cut the cord with an area of myself or a piece of myself that allowed me to just unleash my own potential. 
Shortly thereafter, I launched my very first online course. I started to get much more serious about my blog. I started to grow my business. I started to even then get into podcasting, getting to YouTube, getting into courses and training and all the things that I offer now. And sometimes there's just that one thing that's kind of holding you back. And once you handle that, once you figure that out, and maybe just that low point is actually an, a reason why an indicator that you should get serious about this. This is one of the greatest gifts which can ever be given to you. So if you are struggling, if you have been struggling recently, or you're going through a little bit of a difficult period in your life, launching a campaign, building a new business from scratch, there's no reward like hard work. And if you are willing to put in that hard work, even maybe, you know, having a little bit of difficult time putting the pieces together, but you know you can do it and you know you have the willpower and the only thing you're missing is a guide, my friend, I am here to help you every step of the way. So for those of you that are serious about this and that are interested in really getting a game plan when it comes to crowdfunding and starting your business and growing this sucker, getting tons of people around the world, investing in your company, buying your product, whatever it is, whatever success means to you, you got to check out my option to book an individual coaching call with me. If you book that call, all you got to do is fill out a little bit of information. Tell me more about you, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, and a little bit of your story. And we can get that coaching call scheduled ASAP. These are individual intensive coaching calls that are designed to give you immense confidence going into a campaign as well as all the practical know-how, the inner workings, if you will, of crowdfunding and as well introduce you to other people in the industry who can help you along this path. If you want to check that out, go to crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That link is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash coaching. Crowdcrux.com slash coaching will take you there and you can get that call scheduled ASAP. Thank you so much for showing up. Can't wait for you to get the interview next week. We have a killer one on the books and it's coming to you very soon. Thank you so much again. My name is Sal and I will see you next time.